thank you, Sarah, for this kind introduction. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity to share with the ASR faculty and students about my research on fly year in spare centers. I think this is the first time actually I give a talk at SR as a faculty member. So I think probably a lot of you don't know my research group that much um, because my lab is actually located in uh, Martin Hall. So, um, so I would like to take this opportunity to just give you a brief introduction about the research activities that we're currently uh, pursued. Uh, we're currently pursuing in my sense of time with this lab. So we may be working on these three different areas right now. So the first area is optical sensing and manipulation. So where are we gonna, we actually we're interested in working on um, nanophotonic structures for sensing, imaging, and manipulation. And we also, um, you know, in my group, we also have done a lot of work in miniature fiber optic sensors. Um, and also another line of work is on um, multifunctional optical system on the chip and optical sensor networks. And in the second area, so uh, we're mainly working on sensing and man manipulation of acoustic waves. So currently we're interested in acoustic matter materials for sensing, for cloaking and energy harvesting. And we are also working on photonic crystals for ultrasonic sensing and generation, and also graphene-based acoustic sensors. All right, so the third area is basically bioinspired systems. And recently, you know, um, I have been collaborating with my colleagues, Dr. Elizabeth Smella and uh, Hugh Rock on this multifunctional robotic scheme. So where we can actually put this kind of uh, flexible skin structure on soft robotic structures to uh, maybe achieve both localized sensing and also global sensing. And this will be the topic for today. So uh, where we're gonna discuss the flyer inspect sensors for localization tracking and hopefully later on for navigation. So if you have you know any interest in these other areas that I'm working on, so I mean feel free to contact me and we can discuss probably after the talk. So for this specific topic, so I would like to start with some introduction and background. So if you think about hearing in general in nature, so directional hearing is important. And for most hearing animals, um, they rely on two years to receive directional cues. So we call this binaural hearing systems. And available directional cues can include interaural time difference, this ITD, or interaural intensity difference, which is called IID, or spectrum difference. Okay, so all these differences can help the animals to actually achieve directional hearing, which is kind of the most important um, capability for them to localize the sound source. Okay, so sound source localization is important because it can facilitate a lot of different functions like communication, finding prey, or escape from the predators. You can see from this picture here, so the bat is trying to find this prey by using uh, its echolocation capability. And apparently elephants using acoustic for communications. And if we look at nature, there is a wide diversity of auditory systems. In terms of interaural separation, so this can range from some millimeters to uh, several hundred millimeters. For example, for insect, the interaural separation can be smaller than a millimeter. And for human, for example, for the average male, so the separation between ears is about 170 millimeters. Okay? So you can see the difference. As a direct, direct analogy, an engineer sound vocalization systems. Um, usually people use directional microphones or uh, a real microphones to localize a sound source. And this can be very useful for a lot of applications such as robotic navigation, hearing and devices, speech recognition, or anywhere of sensor networks. And just give an example, for example, for robotic navigation. Um, so normally people use like vision-based navigation so, but if you can use acoustic-based navigation, you basically can increase the field of view by um, 360 degrees. So, vision-based field of view can only be, uh, normally can be less than 180 degrees. So, you can actually significantly improve your field of view for navigation. Um, so, in many of these applications, actually it's more desirable to have a smaller device. 
where like a smaller array to localize the source. That's actually mainly because um, the constraint of the confined spaces. For example, in the case of a micro air vehicle, so usually the size of the micro air vehicle is only less than 15 centimeters. And this is an example. So this, this is a micro air vehicle example. Uh, actually, this one was fabricated by a group of people in uh, Netherlands. I think Sarah must have known this work, right? Okay, so they, I mean, they claim this is the world's smallest camera carrying MAV. The weight of this micro air vehicle is only three grams. Okay, carrying a, a camera, and you can imagine that if we can actually put some sensors, acoustic sensors on this platform, we can actually do the navigation, acoustic navigation, um, you know, with the micro air vehicle. And another example is the hearing aid devices. So for people who require the hearing aid devices, they actually cos cosmetically, they want the device to be as small as possible, um, or even invisible, right? So and in that case, you also need to have a smaller sensor. And also people found that for hearing aid devices, if you use directional microphones, this, the performance can be significantly improved. Okay. And from a medical physics point of view, so using a smaller sensor is also useful. And this can help reduce the perturbation to the primary top field. And also, if you want to measure the near field, and you usually need to use some complex algorithms to compensate for the waveform curvature for, for near field measurements. But in this case, if your sensors are small enough, you don't need to do that anymore. Okay. However, there is a fundamental constraint. We call this size constraint in both biological systems and also in engineering direction microphones or sound localization systems. If you look at this figure, you will see clearly so these, this figure shows two receivers separated by a distance t. Okay, so if you reduce the distance, or calculate the, the available direction cues, such as time difference or intensity difference that you can receive from the two receivers will get smaller and smaller as you reduce the size, the, the separation size. So this means that the distance between the two microphones for two years should be larger than the critical distance in order to be able to obtain sufficient directional information. And this actually calls a fundamental constraint to <coughs> the biological system, especially for small animals such as insects. So their uh, hearing organs are forced to put very close to each other. So it's, for insects, uh, those insects face very, um, it, this, is, this is a fundamental challenge for them. And also for engineer, engineering systems. So if you wanted to min minimize the, the directional microphones or wanting to minimize the uh, acoustic localization array. So this is also a fundamental challenge there. Fortunately, our mother nature has offered us some solutions. Okay, So a very um, remarkable example that people found is in this type of fly. It's a parasitic fly called Ornida. So the female fly is attracted to the five pillars calling some of the, the uh, cricket male cricket, so that's the host of the fly. And if you look at the hearing organ of this fly, the distance between the artery organ is only 520 micrometers. And available ITD uh, difference, or intensity difference, is also very small. ITD is less than 1.5 microseconds, and IID is less than 1 dB. And if you look at the neural receptors for the ear, there are only about 70 um, receptor cells. So the fly actually faces both size constraint and also signal processing constraint. However, okay, so this is the ear structure. You can see that. So um, it's quite small. The separation here is about 500 micrometers. However, um, people found that this ear actually can offer a very high directional sensitivity. It has superior <coughs> directional hearing ability. And the mechanical, at the mechanical level, the uh, interaural time difference can be enhanced to be like 15 microseconds. And the mechanical level of IID is about 10 dB. So you have like significant amplification of these directional cues somehow. And the directional resolution that the fly can achieve is about 2 degrees. That's about the same resolution as humans. Okay. And 
the underlying mechanism, people believe, was because if you look at the ear structures, the two ear drums are coupled by a bridge structure. Okay? So the, this actually gives you a coupled, mechanical coupled structure that has two vibrational modes. If you look at these two vibrational modes, one of them is this type of like walking mode. The two ear drums will move out of phase. The other one is called bending mode. Basically, the two ear drums will move in phase. And people believe that the combination of these two modes will help to amplify, will help am amplify the direction cues. That's why the fly can achieve such a high directional sensitivity or directional re resolution. So up to this point, it seems that you know the puzzle of the fly ear has been resolved. Okay, there's nothing we can do. But if you look at another experiment done by the biologist, which is very intriguing and puzzling. So this one, what people I mean, what, what the biologists did was tether the fly on a sphere structure. So they call this a treadmill. It's, a, it's actually a um, customized treadmill. So it's actually a sphere. Maybe it came from the old type of mouse, mechanical mouse. Okay, so you can move. Basically, the fly is tethered, but the fly can still move on this treadmill. So that the sphere will move, you will know exactly what is the trajectory of the fly, you know, when it, it's walking on this treadmill. And what they got is this type of curve. So they actually measure the turn size as you know the people actually turn the speaker, which play the cricket sound along this asthma direction. So as you turn the speaker, and the fly will actually literally walk toward the speaker direction. And the turn size as a function of the speaker asthma actually follow this kind of um, sigmoid curve. And this means that the fly only can only localize the source accurately within certain range, which is about negative uh, 20 or 30 degrees to about 20 to 30 degrees. And outside of this range, we call this lateralization, which means that a fly can only tell whether the source is coming from it, the left or the right. Okay? So um, nothing, you know, you cannot do localization within outside of that range. So this, this phenomenon is quite interesting, but I mean, people haven't actually dig into why this is the case, but it's kind of like trigger us to think about whether there's certain relationship between the structural parameters of the fly ear and also the calling sound frequency at five kilohertz of this cricket, and also the sound source localization scheme used here by the fly, basically this localization and lateralization uh, scheme. So in this talk, I will try to answer the, these questions we think are pretty interesting and probably will help us to find out the truth about this fly ear. Okay, the first question is, how does the fly ear represent, I mean, does the fly ear represent an optimal structure for localization at this five kilohertz? The second question is, how are the structural parameters of the fly ear tailored to achieve this superior localization <coughs> ability? And then how can a synthetic device to be developed to replicate the optimal characteristic of the fly ear? And in the end, we're going to show how to, if we get the sensors like that, how can we best use these sensors? Oops. So first, I'd like to answer these two first two questions. So I was trained initially as um, a mechanical engineer. Actually, my major was in engineering mechanics. So when I do research, I would always like to start from some fundamentals. When I try to build something, I always try to first understand, try to do some calculations, try to build some model, help me understand the fundamental science, then I can feel comfortable to build something. But just recently, I think that, you know, sometimes you need to be brave. You probably wanted to just start to build something and then start to figure out how, how it works. Okay, so there's something that I wanted to share with you. But you know, for this work, we start from the bottom, the root of the problem. So what we do is we try to do some mechanics model for this ear structure. We know that you know, the fly, uh, in the literature, people have already developed this model. It's a 2D regular model actually developed by Miles in 1995, which shows the, uh, this fly ear structure has two vibrational modes. And actually, our group, when we try to tackle this problem, we thought that this model probably is too simple to capture the essential dynamics of the fly ear structure. So we start with 
some more complicated model. So first we try this IPM model. Okay, so it can at least capture the behavior of the bridge that coupled the two years and also the dynamics of the, the year structure as well. And however, we found that maybe, you know, FPM model, not only the FPM model can also do the continuum mechanics model. And this can help us not only understand the structural dynamics, but we also can study a cavity underneath the ear, which was actually found in the flat ear structure. There was a cavity connect between underneath of the, the ear, between the, the, um, the two ears. So, I mean, this model can capture this, but both of these turned out to be too complicated for us to actually see some really simple signs behind this, this, this behavior. And eventually, more recently, we we're thinking maybe we should revisit this two degree for the model, like you know, developed by the um, the first group. So you can see that this model, if you look at fly year, it looks like a two year jumps coupled by this right. We can model the structure as a two degree for the model uh, with two mass spring damper combination, and the bridge can be modeled as a rotational spring. Uh, a rotational stiffness and also a rotational spring and uh, a rotational damper here. So this model is very simple, but it can at least tell you that the structure has two moles, and the first mole has a natural frequency, uh, <coughs> which is related to the stiffness of the eardrum, the membrane. And the second mole is related to both stiffness, the stiffness of the ear membrane and also stiffness of the bridge. And you can also see that the ratio is actually um, can tell you the stiffness. I mean, the, the ratio of the, the uh, uh, natural frequency is related to the ratio of the stiffness as well. Okay, so that's what we can see from this previous previous model. However, we actually um, use a different approach. We use model analysis that will allow us to get the analytical solution of the direct cues, and we also use n-dimensionalized parameters. And we eventually found that. What's really important to actually define those direction cues are only these parameters, okay? These non-dimensional parameters. The first one is we call this uh, natural frequency ratio, uh, eta, which is the natural frequency of the blocking mode versus the natural frequency of the uh, natural frequency of the bending mode versus the natural frequency of the blocking mode. And another one is this damping ratio, which is the damping factor of this. C1 and the damping factor of this C2 and C1, okay? So, and the third parameter is this we call the separation to wavelengths ratio. Separation means the separation between the two years. Wavelengths means, you know, at which wavelengths this structure is made for, okay? Or the working wavelengths, yes. Good question. So how symmetric is the actual ear? Do you assume the K1 and K2? Yes, they, they are very symmetric. Okay. It's a symmetric. You can assume like K1 and K2, they're the same. And also C1 and C2, or M1 and M2, so these parameters are the same, okay? And based on this model analysis, we also thought maybe we should define some different type of performance parameters that never been investigated. So the first performance parameter we look into is what we call mechanical intraoral time difference, uh, mechanical intraoral phase difference, I'm sorry. So it's actually similar to MITD, so the mechanical time, uh, intraoral time difference, but it's, it's a directional cue that's independent of sound frequency, okay? So that's why we, we, we try to choose that. And another directional performance metric we want to choose is called directional sensitivity. If you think about not only the extra, you know, directional cue is important, and also when you change the angle, you know, how, how much difference you can tell, like when you change the angle, the direction cue difference you can tell, is also important. That actually can be um, determined by using this direction sensitivity we define here, so which is the slope of the direction cue as a function of the azimuth angle, okay? That's just like the sensitivity of the sensor. So if we define these two parameters, and as we said, there are like three different non-dimensional parameters that can be important, so we actually parameter studies of this, you know, based on this model. And for the interest of time, so I, I, I'm only going to show like one set of um, parameter study results, so which can look quite interesting. So if we look at the stiffness ratio, which means that that's the stiffness of the bridge uh, over
or the stiffness of the membrane. So we just look at the stiffness ratio. We change the stiffness ratio, and we see how these, our defined performance metrics will change as a function of asthma's angle. Okay? So we, we see that the fly actually takes this red curve. And with certain like stiffness ratio of the fly year structure, we actually get this red curve. And if you use and coupled two ears, and coupled without the bridge, so you got this um, turquoise curve, okay, this one. And if you use slightly different coupling strengths or this kind of stiffness ratio, you, you lower that down. So you get a soft, much softer beam to couple those two ears. You got this blue, this green curve. And also, if you try to make it very stiff, you get this, you know, dark red colored curve. Okay, so you can see that the performance will be very different if you change the stiffness ratio. But the magic here is the fire actually takes a medium stiffness ratio or a medium coupling. And that means that if you look at the this is stiffness ratio, this chi k, okay, and it's related to the natural frequency ratio, which means that natural frequency ratio needs to be also medium, which means that the separation between the two natural frequencies cannot be too far away, otherwise the ratio will be too big, okay? So that's what the fly does. And if you look at uh, the directional sensitivity, same thing happens. So this is the fly here. And interestingly, you can see that the fly here actually has pretty good directional sensitivity within the range of 30 to negative 30 to 30 degree asthma's angle range. And if you use much stiffer coupling, so this will actually give you a quite high sensitivity just in the middle, line, along the middle line. So it's very, very limited range uh, in the vicinity of the middle line of the ear. And if you use a very soft one, so this will be much lower than if you just do whatever the fly ear does as a medium coupling. Okay. So this maybe give us a hint. Maybe medium coupling is sort of optimal choice. And just taking from this, this, I mean, we, we tried to just investigate a little bit further. And what we did was, not only we wanted to see like uh, the different stiffness ratios, we also wanted to see like for different frequency. We know the fly ear will work at five kilohertz. That's the calling sound of the uh, cricket, the calls of the fly. And if we compare, you know, this is, all these are, all these curves are obtained by using the fly ear structure uh, performance uh, fly years, uh, structure parameters, but at different frequencies. You can see that if we use fly year to localize the sound at two kilohertz, that would be the performance. If we do that at eight kilohertz, that would be the performance. Only at five kilohertz, we can get the almost, maybe the best direction sensitivity we can get. And also, it's almost flat over the range of negative 30 to 30 degrees. Okay. So this is quite interesting, and which actually triggers us to think about, maybe we should define some other parameters to investigate this further. So we just look at, the, within this range, negative 30 to, to 30. If we define two other parameters, one is the average directional sensitivity, which actually shows the average directional sensitivity of this range. And also another parameter is called nonlinearity, which is the deviation of this uh, uh, average directional sensitivity. Uh, the, the, the actual direction of sensitivity uh, with respect to the average direction of sensitivity. So, if we look at you know this region, basically we can we can imagine that the direction of Q as a function of azimuth is almost linear, right? So because it's constant, the slope is constant, which means that it's almost linear. So any deviation from this will be the dynamic. Let's see like how much we can get from that. And if we plot these two performance parameters as a function of frequency, this is what we got. It's quite interesting. So we found that at 5 kilohertz, the fly, based on the fly year parameters, we can get a maximum average directional sensitivity at 5 kilohertz. At the same time, we also got a minimum directional, uh, we also got a minimum linearity at this frequency. Okay, so this phenomenon, we call this your optimality of the fly year. So this tells us that the fly year represents a natural optimal structure that can simultaneously achieve the maximum average direction sensitivity and the minimum nonlinearity at that point. So next, I'm going to show you. So why is your optimality important? Okay. So why does this important for the fly? So if you remember at the beginning, I talked about this uh, experiment done by the biologist about the 
implies localization and lateralization scheme. So if you put these two plots together, you will see like you know there are some correlations here. Within this range, the fly has maximum but also a linear direction sensitivity. And that's also the range that the fly used to localize the source. Okay, so this means that the fly tends to use, and if you look at the hearing organ of this fly, the distance between the artery organ is only 520 micrometers. And available ITD uh, difference or intensity difference is also very small. ITD is less than 1.5 microsecond, and IID is less than 1 dB. And if you look at the neural the receptors for the ear, there are only about 70 um, receptor cells. So the fly actually fits both size constraint and also signal processing constraint. However, okay, so this is the ear structure, you can see that. So um, it's quite small. The separation here is about 520 micrometers. However, um, people found that this ear actually can offer a very high direction sensitivity. It has superior <coughs> directional hearing ability. And the mechanical, at the mechanical level, the uh, inter-hour time difference can be enhanced to be like 15 microseconds. And the mechanical level of IID is about 10 dB. So you have like significant amplification of these directional cues somehow. And the directional resolution that the fly can achieve is about two degrees. That's about the same resolution as humans. And the underlying mechanism, people believe, was because if you look at the ear structures, the two ear jumps are coupled by a bridge structure. Okay? So that this actually gives you a couple, mechanical coupled structure that has two vibrational modes. If you look at these two vibrational modes, one of them is this type of like rocking mode. The two ear jumps will move out of phase. The other one is called bending mode. Basically, the two ear jumps will move in phase. And people believe that the combination of these two modes will help to amplify, will help am amplify the direction cues. That's why the fly can achieve such a high direction sensitivity or direction re resolution. So up to this point, it seems that you know the puzzle of the fly here has been resolved. Okay, there's nothing we can do. But if you look at another experiment done by the biologist, which is very intriguing and puzzling. So this one, what people I mean, what, what the biologists did was tether the fly on a sphere structure. So they call this a treadmill. It's, a, it's actually a um, customized treadmill. So it's actually a sphere. Maybe it came from the old type of mouse, mechanical mouse. Okay, so you can move. Basically, the fly is tethered, but the fly can still move on this treadmill. So that the sphere will move, you will know exactly what is the trajectory of the fly, you know, when it, it's walking on this treadmill. And what they got is this type of curve. So they actually measure the turn size as you know the people actually turn the speaker to play the cricket sound along this azimuth direction. So as you turn the speaker, and the fly will actually literally walk toward the speaker direction. And the turn size as a function of the speaker azimuth actually follow this kind of um, sigmoid curve. And this means that the fly only can only localize the source accurately within certain range, which is about negative uh, 20 or 30 degrees to about 20 to 30 degrees. And outside of this range, we call this lateralization, which means that the fly can only tell whether the source is coming from it, the left or the right. Okay? So um, nothing, you know, you cannot do localization within outside of that range. So this, this phenomenon is quite interesting, but I mean, people haven't actually dig into why this is the case, but it's kind of like trigger us to think about whether there's certain relationship between the structural parameters of the fly here and also the calling sound frequency at five kilohertz of this cricket, and also the sound source localization scheme used here by the fly, basically this localization and lateralization uh, scheme. So in this talk, I will try to answer the, these questions we think are pretty interesting and probably will help us to find out the truth about this fly ear. Okay, the first question is, how does the fly ear represent, I mean, does the fly ear represent an optimal structure for localization at this five kilohertz? The second question is, 
how are the structural pioneers of the five here tailored to achieve this superior localization ability? And then how can the synthetic device be developed to replicate the optimal characteristic of the pioneer? And in the end, we're gonna show how to, if we get the sensors like that, how can we best use these sensors? Oops. So first I'd like to answer these two first two questions. So I was trained initially as um, a mechanical engineer. Actually my major was in engineering mechanics. So when I do research, I would always like to start from some fundamentals. When I try to build something, I always try to first understand, try to do some calculations, try to build some model, help me understand the fundamental science, then I can feel comfortable to build something. But just recently, I think that, you know, sometimes you need to be brave. You probably wanted to just start to build something and then start to figure out how, how it works. Okay, so there's something that I wanted to share with you. But, you know, for this work, we start from the bottom, the root of the problem. So what we do is we try to build some mechanics model for this year structure. We know that, you know, the fly, uh, in the literature, people have already developed this model. It's a 2D regular model actually developed by Miles in 1995, which shows the, uh, this flat here structure has two vibrational modes. And actually our group, when we try to tackle this problem, we thought that this model probably is too simple to capture the essential dynamics of the flat year structure. So we start with some more complicated models. So first we try this FDM model. Okay, so it can at least capture the behavior of the bridge that coupled the two years and also the dynamics of the, the year structure as well. And however, we found that maybe, you know, FDM model, not only the FDM model can also do the continuum mechanics model. And this can help us not only understand the structural dynamics, but we also can study a cavity underneath the ear, which was actually found in the flat year structure. There was a cavity connect between enemies of the, the year, between the, the, um, the two years. So, I mean, this model can capture this, but both of these turn out to be too complicated for us to actually see some really simple signs behind this, this, this behavior. And eventually, more recently, we, we're thinking maybe we should revisit this 2 degree for the model, like, you know, developed by the, um, the first group. So you can see that this model, if you look at fly year, it looks like a two year jumps couple by this grade. We can model the structure as a two degree fit of model uh, with two mass spring damper combination. And the bridge can be modeled as a rotational spring, uh, a rotational stiffness, and also a rotational spring and uh, a rotational damper here. So this model is very simple, but it can at least tell you that the structure has two moles and the first mode has a natural frequency, uh, which is related to the stiffness of the eardrum, the membrane. And the second mode is related to both stiffness, the stiffness of the ear membrane and also stiffness of the bridge. And you can also see that the ratio is actually, um, can tell you the stiffness, I mean, the, the ratio of the, the uh, uh, natural frequency is related to the ratio of the stiffness as well. Okay, so that's what we can see from this preview previous model. However, we actually um, use a different approach. We use model analysis. That will allow us to get the analytical solution of the direct cues. And we also use non-dimensionalized parameters. And we eventually found that what's really important to actually define those direct cues are only these parameters, okay? These non-dimensional parameters. The first one is, we call this uh, natural frequency ratio. Uh, eta, which is the natural frequency of the rocking mode versus the natural frequency of the uh, natural frequency of the bending mode versus the natural frequency of the rocking mode. And another one is this damping ratio, which is the damping factor of this C1 and the damping factor of this C2 and C1. Okay. So, and the third parameter is this we call the separation to wavelength ratio. Separation means the separation between the two years. Wavelength means, you know, at which wavelength the structure is made for, okay? Or the working wavelengths, yes. So how symmetric is the actual ear? Can you assume K1 and K2? Yes, they, they are very symmetric. It's a symmetric, yeah. 
you can assume like P1 and P2, they're the same. And also C1 is and C2, or M1 and M2. So these parameters are the same, okay? And based on this model analysis, we also thought maybe we should define some different type of performance parameters that never been investigated. So the first performance parameter we look into is what we call mechanical intraoral time difference, uh, in, me mechanical intraoral phase difference, I'm sorry. So it's actually similar to MITD, so the mechanical time, uh, intraoral time difference, but it's, it's a directional cue that's independent of sound frequency, okay? So that's why we, we, we try to choose that. And another directional performance measure we want to choose is called directional sensitivity. If you think about not only the extra, you know, directional cue is important, and also when you change the angle, you know, how, how much difference you can tell, like when you change the angle, the directional cue difference you can tell is also important. That actually can be um, determined by using this directional sensitivity we define here, so which is the slope of the direction Q as a function of the azimuth angle, okay? That's just like the sensitivity of the sensor. So if we define these two parameters, and as we said, there are like three different non-dimensional parameters that are kind of important, so we actually did primary studies of this, you know, based on this model. And for the interest of time, so I, I, I'm only gonna show like one set of um, primary study results, so which kind of, quite interesting. So if we look at the stiffness ratio, which means that that's the stiffness of the bridge uh, over the stiffness of the membrane. So we just look at the stiffness ratio. We change the stiffness ratio, and we see how these, our defined performance metrics will change as a function of azimuth angle, okay? So we, we see that the fly actually takes this red curve, and with certain like stiffness ratio of the fly layer structure, we actually get this red curve. And if you use and coupled two ears, and coupled without the bridge, so you got this um, turbulence curve, okay, this one. And if you use slightly different coupling strengths or this kind of stiffness ratio, you, you lower that down. So you get a soft, much softer beam to couple those two ears. You got this blue, and then this green curve. And also, if you try to make it very stiff, you get this, you know, dark red colored curve, okay? So you can see that the performance will be very different if you change the stiffness ratio. But the message here is the flyer actually takes a medium stiffness ratio or a medium coupling. And that means that if you look at the this is stiffness ratio, this chi k, okay? And it's related to the natural frequency ratio, which means that natural frequency ratio needs to be also medium, which means that the separation between the two natural frequencies cannot be too far away. Otherwise, the ratio will be too big, okay? So that's what the fly does. And if you look at uh, the directional sensitivity, same thing happens. So this is the fly here. And interestingly, you can see that the fly here actually has pretty good directional sensitivity within the range of 30 to negative 30 to 30 degree asthma's angle range. And if you use much stiffer coupling, so this will actually give you a quite high sensitivity just in the middle, line, along the middle line. So it's very, very limited range uh, in the vicinity of the middle line of the ear. And if you use a very soft one, so this will be much lower than if you just do whatever the fly ear does as a medium coupling. Okay. So this maybe give us a hint. Maybe medium coupling is sort of optimal choice. And just taking from this, this, I mean, we, we tried to just investigate a little bit further. And what we did was, not only we, we wanted to see like uh, the different stiffness ratios, we also wanted to see like for different frequencies. We know the fly ear will work at five kilohertz. That's the calling sound of the uh, cricket, the pulse of the fly. And if we compare, you know, this is, all these are, all these curves are obtained by using the fly ear structure uh, performance uh, fly years uh, structure parameters, but at different frequencies. You can see that if we use fly year to localize the sound at two kilohertz, that would be the performance. If we do that at eight kilohertz, that would be the performance. Only at five kilohertz, we can get the almost, maybe the best direction sensitivity we can get. And also, it's almost flat over the range of negative 30 to 30 degrees. Okay. So this is quite interesting, and which actually triggers us to think about, maybe we should define some other parameters to investigate this further. So we just look at 
within this range, negative 30 to, to 30. If we define two other parameters, one is the average directional sensitivity, which actually shows the average directional sensitivity of this range. And also another parameter is cognitive energy, which is the deviation of this uh, uh, average directional sensitivity, uh, the, the, the actual directional sensitivity uh, with respect to the average directional sensitivity. So if we look at you know, this region, basically we can, we can imagine that the directional Q as a function of azimuth is almost linear, right? So because it's constant, the slope is constant, which means that it's almost linear. So any deviation from this will be the net average. Let's see like how much we can get from that. And if we plot these two performance parameters as a function of frequency, this is what we got. It's quite interesting. So we found that at five kilohertz, the flight, based on the five year parameters, we can get a maximum average directional sensitivity at five kilohertz. At the same time, we also got a minimum directional, uh, we also got a minimum gravity at this frequency. Okay, so this phenomenon we call this your optimality of the flight year. So this tells us that the flight year represents a natural optimal structure that can simultaneously achieve the maximum average direction sensitivity and the minimum natural area at that point. So the next step I'm going to show you, so why is your optimality important? Okay, so why does this important for the flight? So if you remember, at the beginning I talked about this uh, experiment done by the biologists about the flight's localization and lateralization. See, so if you put these two plots together, you will see like, you know, there are some correlations here. Within this range, the flight has maximum, but also a linear direction sensitivity. And that's also the range that the flight used to localize the source. Okay, so this means that the fly tends to use the azimuth range with a higher directional sensitivity, not a range with a, a larger uh, MIPD, that's the directional cube. So outside of the region, all, so the directional cube is actually larger, but the sensitivity is lower. So that's not the region that fly used to localize the source. Only when the directional sensitivity is maximum, maximum, ma maximized, so the fly will use that range. And another thing is, the linear and also maximal directional sensitivity can help the fly to perform the localization task much faster and more accurately. So you can imagine like with so few neural cells to process the information, linear and maximum is apparently the best. So nature knows the best. Okay. Uh, so another very interesting result is, uh, actually we did this after we, we've done all this work. We also found that this range from negative 30 to 30, so this roughly range, is also an optimal choice. If you try to increase the range, maybe to you know, much larger than 30 degree, like this case is 90 degree, so you won't be able to get the linear relationship anymore, so this direction sensitivity also will be low, just close to the middle line. And if you shrink the range a little bit smaller, and what you see is you get almost the same direction sensitivity, but at the cost of you know your, your range is limited in this case. Okay, so this 30 degrees range also seems to be optimal. All right, so now let's revisit those on the questions that I raised at the beginning. So does the flight year represent an optimal structure for localization at five kilohertz? Yes, the flight year we show that is indeed represents the natural optimal structure at its working frequency of five kilohertz. And the second question is how are the structural parameters of the flight year tailored to achieve its superior uh, localization ability. So we show here, the flight year actually used uh, appropriate, uh, appropriate contribution from both rocking and bending modes. So if you remember, the stiffness ratio, the medium stiffness ratio actually is achieved by appropriate contribution from both the rocking mode and bending mode. So you have to use both of them with appropriate ratio in order to be able to achieve this optimal behavior. And this also facilitates the fly's unique localization and lateralization scheme that allows the fly to overcome its small size uh, and accurately pinpoint its holes. So we believe that this is even more important than the coupling itself. So it's how you actually make the coupling happen, how you actually achieve this kind of coupling. Now, does, the, does that fly have any way to actively change no, no. Actually, um, what people find is no, they don't. They, they don't have a um, 
the way to change the stimulus. But for normal cricket, so there's a range of the frequencies, um, normally from like 4.5 kilohertz to about like 5.2 kilohertz. I mean, I don't remember exactly, but it's within a very narrow range. And the slider, even though it's actually optimized at 5 kilohertz, but it's quite robust, like if you shift a little bit, it still can actually get pretty good performance. All right, so the next question I'm trying to, I'm gonna try to address is, how can a synthetic device be developed to mimic the optimal characteristics of the flight gear, okay? Um, so before I talk about our work, I would like to just review, you know, some other group's work because I believe that inspiration can be drawn differently, right? So different people, I mean, when you see the same thing, you can actually have different type of inspiration. And the first line of work actually, um, we call these pressure gradient microphone or pressure differential microphones, uh, which were developed, in this line of um, devices were developed by uh, a group, um, Professor Miles group at uh, SUNY Binghamton, uh, and another group in California. And for these type of devices, what they're trying to do is make this membrane device, a very rigid plate membrane device, and support by a flexible pivot. So this structure basically is like a seesaw structure which can rotate, you know, uh, about a compliant, like axis, very easily, okay? So when you have very little pressure gradient acting on these membranes, so this membrane can deform, and then you can pick up, you know, the, the deformation of the membrane as a function of the azimuths that will give you the directional information. And if you look at the structure, I mean, the structural design actually pushes the banking mode very far away from the walking mode. If you remember, what we found the fly does is, you know, have a appropriate, you know, banking mode, walking mode uh, ratio. But in this case, the banking mode is pushed very far away, okay? And primarily, these devices actually use the walking mode to detect, it's like a seesaw structure, just like a walking. And the good thing about it is it's quite sensitive but if you think about, this is quite different from the fly's binaural system. It has to be combined with a, another omnidirectional microphone, which can measure the sound pressure at the same time, because this device also is also sensitive to the sound intensity. So you have to actually rely on another microphone to give you the sound pressure information and combine it with this result to get directional cue, uh, directional information. Okay, that's, you know, that's just like, you know, this, these two groups there go. And there's also another line of work, um, which were, the, these structures were developed by a group in Japanese and also another group in Ch China. So what they primarily uh, doing is using this kind of structure, either a gimbal structure or a thin plate with slit structure. Basically that's a simply supported structure. Gimbal structure is supported in the middle of the membrane. And the slit structure is actually supported at the edge of the membrane. So this way, um, you could actually use the bending mode of the structure to measure the sound pressure gradient. And the problem with these structures are, it's very difficult to detect the de defection because in this case, like the membrane can, um, can bend this way or that way. So it's quite difficult to get the um, detection uh, incorporated with these devices. And also it's, Primary, primarily using the um, banking mode. So it's different from what fly does, just try to use both of the banking and locking modes. And our starting point, yes? Yes, the previous page, uh, could you play, explain once again the what banking mode and the what is routing oh, so mode if you look and at what the is the natural frequency? Okay, so if you look at the structure at the fly here with two membranes, right? So bending mode means that the two years will move in phase like this. The rocking mode means that the two years will move out of phase. So this structure is like a seesaw, so it only uses this kind of rocking mode. The other structure is simply supported. Okay, it's supported like this. So it only deformed like this or that like this. And what is the natural frequency? The natural frequency, actually I forgot, I, I mean, um, for, but for this one, um, I believe it's in like it's still in kilohertz range, but uh, I mean the, the device actually work close to the the uh, the rocking mode natural frequency, and this one 
the device actually work close to the sighting mode as you can see. Yeah, so it's actually just like a different type of um, mechanism. Okay. So our starting point is design space optimization. So because our goal is trying to not only mimic the structure just from looking at the appearance of the flywheel, but also uh, try to mimic the mechanism of the flywheel. And, and uh, the design goal is try to build a flywheel inspired sensor that can capture the steel optimal characteristic. So in the design space, what we did was first trying to um, set up these two design objectives. We're trying to maximize the average structural sensitivity and minimize the linearity at the same frequency, at the same working frequency. And the design variables that we can change are the natural frequencies, including bending mode natural frequency and rocking mode natural frequency, and also separation to wavelength ratio. That's the device separation versus the working uh, frequency of the wavelength, working frequency of the sound, I mean, the equivalent wavelengths of the sound. And this is the result. We see that we can, we can indeed get this kind of um, other structure similar to the flight here. And this is natural frequency as a function of separation to wavelength ratio. And you can see that if we put the flight parameters into this model, these two dots actually shows the flight here structure, which perfectly located on this optimized curve. So these are optimized natural frequencies. Okay, the flight here are here. Okay, so it's, it's another proof that the flight here is indeed a, a, a natural um, design optimal structure. So since the goal is trying to do your optimality at different frequencies, we also look at um, at the different damping ratio, and we look at maybe we can also get you know these two optimized natural frequency um, as a function of the separation to wavelength ratio. So basically, you can um, just define your device size, and then you choose the specific frequency you'd like your device to work at. So you can choose basically natural frequency that can allow you to get a similar device that working at a different frequency, similar device as the fly here. And if we look at here, we have three sets of designs, red and this uh, magenta, and also blue color. So you can see that for each of these designs, if we plot the average direction sensitivity and net energy as a function of frequency, all of them look like this fly here. So at this, in this case, the red design, we have the system optimized at two kilohertz. And then another one, for example, is 12 kilohertz, you get you know, another set of optimal um, structure. So basically, with these two curves, I mean, whatever frequency you can think of, you can always get a optimal structure that will um, meet your need for this, this, this type of um, device. Okay, so we show that we can definitely create optimal inside the devices to mimic the flight year, and which can tailor, which can be tailored to work at any frequency if you follow these two curves. And this is our sensor design. So because the goal is to build a sensor that can based on the pure optimality of the flight year, which is like the full employment of the flight year's mechanism. So we use two circular membranes structurally coupled by a bridge. And with the structure, we can uh, properly uh, we can properly tune the combination of the rocking and bending characteristics because we can think about the stiffness of the membrane can be tuned separately from the stiffness of the bridge with this structure. And also, we use instead of just directly detect the uh, deflection, we, we also do some calculations for the MIPP, which is the phase difference that you receive from these two um, membranes. Um, to actually capture the flies by our hearing. And the last thing we did was actually use optical fiber detection system to detect the deflection of the membrane. Okay. So um, this is the optical system that we use to detect the membrane deflection. And uh, this is a low coherence fiber optical parameter we developed like many years ago. It can allow us to get high signal to noise ratio, high uh, resolution and low noise, and also uh, can ensure that we get reliable measurement. And the first step we did was actually get a large scale proof of concept system. And you can see that how large the system is. So I, I would like to just build something and then see whether 
of, you know, we can get something first before we, we, we actually go, go into the smaller devices. So this device has a separation about 25.4 millimeters between these two membranes. And it allows us to achieve an amplification of the rock and cues about 4.2 times. It's not great, but you know, it shows that the, the, the concept works. And then we went forward to develop this mass device. So our latest device looks like this. It has four layer, um, it's, it has four layers. The first layer is a device layer. It has these two membranes coupled by a bridge structure. So the membranes are fabricated based on the silicon <coughs> material with thickness of 0.5 micrometers and radius of about 500, uh, 550 micrometers. The separation between the two membranes is about 1.2 millimeters, it's the same size as the right here. And a bridge, in order to be able to tune the stiffness, we actually use alternate layers of silicon, um, silicon oxide and silicon nitride. So um, this can allow us to actually tune the stiffness if we need to deposit more layers, we have to make it more uh, it makes it stiffer. And the damping was tuned by using those uh, uh, perforated holes. So you can see that this layer has those holes. So we can actually control the damping by using those, um, the design of the holes. And this is a uh, SM picture of the membrane uh, coupled by this bridge structure. And our, our assembly device looks like this. You can see that how, how um, the, the size compared with the the fly. So this fly is not warming up, but it's actually a house fly. It's a dead house fly. So we did the sensor characterization at AL, AL because uh, we need to use their acoustic chamber. So this is what we got. Uh, in terms of the directional cubes, we defined using MIPD. That's the base difference between the two years, between the two um, membranes. And this one is the directional Q as a function of azimuth angle and also frequency. So this will give us like the whole picture about the performance in two dimensions. Um, and we also compare with the uh, simulation with a two degree field model. You can see that you know uh, these two are compare uh, agree with each other. And the natural frequencies of this mass device uh, by design, we we try to design this work. I mean this rocking of uh, of the device at five at the 9.5 kilohertz and bank mode at 20.2 kilohertz. And the experiment shows us, shows that, you know, this uh, uh, natural frequency of the rocking mode is at 9.8 kilohertz and bank mode at 22 kilohertz. So it's quite close to the design value. And we believe that, you know, the, the, the discrepancy is due to the residual stress because the mass fabrication process. This is our 
nasty ones. So let's try some more, right? And if you look at the performance, this is from simulation just based on the fly years um, structural parameters. We can see that the fly is optimized at five kilohertz in terms of the average drug sensitivity and dynamic energy. And this is external results we got from this device. You can see at the designed working frequency of eight kilohertz, we got maximum average drug sensitivity as well as a minimum non-energy with this device. So the performance is quite similar to the fly here as well. Okay, so now we have this answer. So the last part of the talk, I would like to just share with you some of the um, um, approach that we are taking to best use, we think that is best use of the fly here in smart sensors, but maybe you can give me some better suggestions. So how can we best use these sensors? The first approach, so which is, which is actually inspired by the fly's localization scheme. So if you uh, play a sound, the fly will actually naturally turn the middle, middle line of the ear toward the source until like the, you know, the, the, the middle line is within the linear range and then just go forward. So that's the case. So this can actually inspire us. Maybe we can use you know, the performance. This is the direction Q as a function of the azimuth angle performance we got from our fly ear inspired sensor. We can actually just use this performance. Um, just do something similar to what the fly does. And let's just revisit this uh, localization and lateralization localization scheme. So if we, we can actually just make a very similar curve as what the fly turn angle as a function of azimuth angle, I mean turn, turn size as the azimuth angle curve is. So this is the, you know, the, this part is the experiment data from our sensor. And this green curve, these two portions of the green curve, actually just shows a constant uh, phase difference, which means that in this region we don't care about you know how accurate we can localize the sound. We just like you know we can make them constant. So this sigmoid curve can allow us to just simulate what the fly does. For example, if the the source is in the angle outside of the linear range, so we just turn a constant turn size. And then until this middle line of the year is within, middle line of the device is within the linear range. So it's just like the fly's localization and lateralization scheme, very simple. And with this scheme, actually, we were able to um, demonstrate 1D sound localization and tracking uh, with accuracy better than two degrees. And that's about the same accuracy as the fly here. Okay? So if you can see, that's our experiment setup. So here we have the sensor mounted on a um, the aluminum rod. So it's just like a holder. So the sensor is much smaller than a holder apparently. And the speaker is here. So this is not a good picture. You can see a lot of other like messy stuff in the lab. And hopefully you can see better things from this video. So um, which was, this video was taken um, by my um, Lab member actually uh, who's sitting here, Dr. Hajin Liu. He's currently a um, research associate working in my group and also at NIST. Um, I think he's Okay. So, first you see the device in here with the, the fly. And this is our sensor mounted on the holder. So, first we're going to show a stationary localization. Initially, like the sensor has uh, a angle with respect to the source about 90 degrees. So you can see that after three steps, first change to the linear range and then go forward. So that's just with three steps, you can localize the source. This one is a random tracking. So what it does is the uh, speaker, we simulate the movement of the speaker by one of the stage, motorized, motorized stage. And the sensor is mounted on another motorized stage. So basically, the speaker is moving randomly. And this um, sensor stage is trying to follow whatever the speaker does. So you can see this plot shows the tracking results. So pretty much, you can follow. Okay. So pretty much, you can follow whatever.
the speaker does, and the accuracy is about two degrees. Does the fly do a zigzag as it's approaching a target? Or is it no, the, the, the fly doesn't do that. Um, in, in normal case, no. So, but uh, I mean, biologists also did a very interesting experiment, like trying to move the, the source like the zigzag way, and the fly is trying to do that too. Okay, so the second approach that we're trying to do uh, in order to utilize the, you know, this type of sensor is actually inspired by another experiment done by biologists. So uh, what this is, what they did was actually um, first in a dark space, just like release a fly at the same time turn on the speaker that played um, the, the, the speaker was playing the cricket song, and then just for a few seconds, very quickly, and turn on the speaker, and the fly is in the middle of flying. And they found that just within a very short period of time, the fly can gather enough information, and still, this fly was still able to localize the source accurately. So this actually gives us maybe some hint. If we can make a very compact device with several sensors like put together, just you know, within a very confined space, we could probably also localize the source accurately, just like the fly, just like follow maybe the fly, fly's trajectory and whatever orientation that we have for the sensor to do that. And then we can have <coughs> stationary array, which is much smaller than the current large scale sound localization system, which is usually like meters by meters large. Okay, so that's the idea. So, I mean, um, we actually work we were trying to pursue this, and we found that maybe we don't need even like several different sensors. We can just have several um, membranes coupled, each of them are coupled, just like the fly here. So in this case, we have a three membrane device. Each two of the membranes are coupled by this bridge structure. So this will give us a device which can um, help localize something in two dimensions. Okay, and this is the mass everything membrane with the um, three couple membranes. So this is the uh, actually device after assemble with optical fibers compared with the um, head. And with this device, we were able to um, get some quite interesting results. So this was done by my um, master's student, um, Andrew Liswiski. So he got some good results. So we see that for the three membrane device, we still have rocking mode and bending mode. But instead of have, having just one rocking and one bending mode, we actually can get two rocking modes and another bending mode. So the two rocking modes are at the same frequency. And in this case, for this device, it's at 11.3 kilohertz. And bending mode, because we wanted to make sure that you know the ratio is appropriate. So we got 19.9 kilohertz. So this device, we tested, and we found that it can help amplify the direction cues along two dimensions. One is the azimuth angle direction, the other one is the elevation angle. So we pretty much can use this device to localize a source in 2D. Okay. I'm sure that the 3D can be tackled somehow, but it's, it's going to be much more complicated. So that will be probably be our future work. So um, here I'm showing some ongoing and future work in this area. Um, so one line of work that we're trying to do, or I mean, we have already um, done something, is robotic acoustic homing localization tracking in two dimensions and three dimensions. So 2D problem is easy, but three-dimensional problem is quite complicated. And another thing that we're trying to do right now is, uh, because we know that the fly is a mechanical couple structure. The fly here is a mechanical couple structure. And we're trying to see whether we can actually use, uh, because we already um, get the tracing function of the structure. So we got like what is the input and the output after we can copy, we got that output. So we basically know the tracing function now. So whether we can actually do some circuit to electrically couple any two microphones. In this case, you don't need to worry about like, you know, the mass fabrication. You have some like uh, fabrication difficulty about how you can arrange the structure. You just need to tune your, your um, your circuits, so that's much easier job, right? So, I mean, right now, actually, my group, so uh, I have an Edinburgh student, Kevin, who's helping with this project right now. So, we got some very um, promising results. So, it seems that it's possible to just couple the two microphones with electronics. 
And another thing that I would like to do that I haven't got you know, into that is active and passive hosting navigation. So that will probably be something that I would like to um, pursue in the future. All right, so in the end, I would like to acknowledge the people who actually made this happen. So Dr. Hajin Lee, who's sitting here, uh, so he actually did most of this work. And also um, my former um, master student, Andrew Liz Whiskey, so he did the multi-membrane couple of device. And also Dr. Lay's uh, Sauerput, so he's currently an assistant professor in Jordan Institute of Technology. And also, I'd like to say my collaborators, they used to be at ARL, but both of them actually moved. Uh, Luke Carano and also Danny G. Luke Carano, right now, he's in uh, APL, and Danny, he joined the company in Houston. All right, thank you very much.